Can you hear me okay? I mean, the microphone's a little, you know, bouncy, but I, you guys are okay. It's the main thing. Thanks so much for coming this morning. I really appreciate you coming out. Um, we have an hour together. I love it. It's a small group. It makes it it makes it kind of fun for me and sometimes more interesting. And if you're if you're okay with it, I can you know ask you to feel free to join in or ask a question as we're going. I don't have any problem with that. Um, what I'm going to present today is is kind of generic, but it's also kind of specific. So I might be covering something that doesn't apply to you at all, and I might be covering something that applies very specific to you. So for that reason, that I like to be able to be available afterwards if you want to ask a question or. Uh, some of the handouts that I brought probably are more specific to what might be helpful to you. So that's the reason why I do that. But, you know, feel free to, to jump in. Um, so here's something I'm going to give you just background. I've worked in the counseling field for a very long time. And one of the things I discovered when I was doing what I did before I came here to Tidewell is people have a lot of stress over the holidays for various reasons. It doesn't have to be related to a loss or a death, but it's a stressful time. And in every place I've been, we find that during the holiday season, people are less prone to come in to get counseling or less prone to come in to a group or for support, emotional support. And I, I have a theory. I, I can't prove it's true, but I think what it is is they, f oh, by the way, the other part of it is mid-January, all of a sudden, our referrals go up. People come in much more often. They, they, we, we really get a jump in our counseling referrals in mid-January. So my theory is, and I've had people tell me, they get together, they figure out, I have to get through the holidays, I have to tough it out for various reasons. It's important to my family, it's important to me. <clears throat> but it's not because they're not stressed. It's because they're you know, just trying to make it work. And that's why they come in, you know, two weeks later. So I just want to give you that part. You know, if that's going on, that's a normal kind of a process for people. Um, and I, that's my history. And, I, and I, I don't know that I can prove that, but I'm pretty sure it's accurate. So trying to get a meaningful holiday. Then this is the right click. Do we know? Here's what we're going to kind of talk about. And it's, it's, it's specifics of stress sort of what, how that connects to just in general, even if it's not related to the holiday. Uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit about finding meaning, which I think is very important for somebody, especially they've had a loss around the holidays. So maybe they got to, finding meaning is important in terms of it's a change for them. They may have to find a different meaning for the holidays to make it, you know, get through it. I put childlike attitude on there, and we'll cover it more in detail, but I think that is one of the reasons why Christmas works for people. It's one of the reasons why it's difficult when you can't have that childlike attitude. Um, we'll talk about traditions that people have and maybe being able to evaluate that that, that sees, you know, maybe in a way to see, well, that, maybe that's causing me more stress, or maybe there's a way I can create a new tradition that will make it easier for me. Um, and some just general stress relief tips, some parenting tips, if, if any of you are still parenting or if you're grandparenting, by the way, that works as well. Uh, if, and maybe you can pass along to your, your children that they can pass along to their kids. I'm a grandparent, so I know a lot of this stuff makes sense to me. I wish I'd have known it when I was actually the parent. I'd probably been a better parent. Um, and then just something about the holiday blues a little bit. So let's start by um, seeing how stressed you are, if that's okay. So there, there is a, there's been a breakthrough research on stress. Uh, after 18 years of research, Duke University Pres Professor Harold Herschel Boxmeyer developed a stress survey that is accurate with 96% of respondents. So he can tell you if you're stressed or not. So the way this works is, <coughs> I'm going to show you a picture of two dolphins. You can see both dolphins, your stress level is within the acceptable range. If you see anything other than two dolphins, your stress level is too high. Do you know what's coming here? Somebody tipped up. All right. All of you see two dolphins? No. Okay. So we know. Tell me if anybody sees two dolphins, and I'm really worried. Okay. So 
the, the point here is everybody's stressed a little bit during the holidays or, or generally, uh, or you know somebody who is. And, and I, I wanted to define it, you know, the, the, for me, the, and I've done this for years, uh, trying to define stress and how it works. Best definition I've ever seen is it's, and it's simple, it's high demand, low control. Everything is right there for you. So if you're normally stressed and it's related to high demand and then holiday happens and there's more demands, more demands on your time, more demands on your emotional you know, presence, whatever the case may be, that just means that demand's gone up so the stress has gone up. The key for us, you, you can do more with the control than you can with the demand. So the key is to be able to have some control. Uh, if you have low control or don't feel like don't feel like you have control, and that's important. Even if you have some control, or can convince yourself you have some control, it'll reduce the stress. So I spend more time on helping people with getting the the control or getting the feeling that they have the control than I do with actually the demand, because the demand's kind of like a little harder to manipulate. Does that make sense? So decreasing demand or increasing one's sense of control can significantly reduce stress. I mean really significantly. So you can really see that happen uh, specifically. So most of you probably know this. There's two basic types of stress. Eustress, stress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -S, is the what we call the good stress. Theoretically, Christmas holidays would be eustress. stress. Wedding would be youth stress. Again, theoretically. So good stress, get married, I'm happy, there's there's presents, there's you know, wedding presents, there's there's honeymoon. Uh, you can kind of see how quickly that can turn into distress. Have you seen different reasons for that? Christmas is the same thing. I mean it's there's there's a lot of good reminders, there's presents, there's holiday parties, um, but it can easily go into distress. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why. So what you're trying to do is, is have some level of good stress being higher than the distress or the bad stress. And what we find uh, with most people is you have to have some stress. What, what would happen if you didn't have any stress at all? You'd be shocked and surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, yeah you'd be, first of all, you'd be surprised. You'd be like, what's going on? But what would happen just for the physiological aspects of the human body if you didn't have stress? You wouldn't function, right? You, would, you wouldn't really be able, to, you wouldn't have enough motivation to go and eat breakfast or go to a meeting. So you have to have some level of stress moving at some time. So the key is not to not have stress, but to have it be more you stress than this stress. So acute stress comes and goes quickly. You might consider, in general, for the definition, Christmas holiday acute stress. It kind of sneaks up, but it comes, it's over, and you know, it's, like it's gone. So if you come out of the Christmas stress, but now you're moving on, that would be considered acute stress. Chronic stress would be long-term stress. So if you come out of the holidays, you've had the stress of the holidays plus the other stress, and you're still feeling low, you're still down, you're still having a hard time getting motivated and getting energy back up, that's more chronic stress. I suspect that's what people have more difficulty with, and that's what we really try to, hopefully this is geared to help you a little bit with, with the chronic stress. Make sense? Okay. Interesting piece of this, and just so you know why it's important to kind of get rid of the stress, is, is higher sustained stress over a long period of time actually can kill off brain cells that are essential for new learning. So that's why people kind of stay depressed or say, you know, they're, they're not, not only are they feeling stressed and feeling down, they're actually losing some brain cells that would allow them to learn new things or to be able to adjust or be able to function in a different way. So it's important that we know that and, and try to work on getting rid of that. So you see a kind of a overwhelmed Santa Claus there. So very important part of what we're going to do here is, is talk about finding the meaning. And so if, if in, now I'm going to assume somebody may have had some, some heavy duty losses, some really, some losses that are just devastating and are hard to get past. We find that oftentimes, whether the loss happened near the holidays or not, 
the holidays make that loss much more difficult. The, the reasons are, are many. Um, first of all, whether it's recent or two, two, five, ten years ago, the holidays reminder of, of you know, that person not being there. So again, the holidays exacerbate or, or make the loss a little bit more, more intense. So around the holidays, before the loss, there was some, there was a meaning. You know, they have a, there's a meaning to the holidays. Uh, to take that person away, a lot of times will change that meaning. So the holidays become less meaningful for the person who's had the loss. So the reason why I put up there, what things create meaning for you, um, if if they're connected to a loss, you have to almost replace that or, or find some other things that have meaning. You're not going to replace that person, but you can replace something that has meaning. And it might be relating to somebody else that you're a loved one or somebody else in your family who, who represents something, who, who needs your attention, needs your support, needs your you know affection. So again, that might be the new meaning. Um, and that's, that's really sounds hard, but it's something you can really look at. Some of the handouts I have have some really specific suggestions for finding new meaning. So here's another key part when you're getting ready, and probably we're well into the holidays now, and when you're getting ready to start the, the stressful part of it where everything's active, everything's going on, you're seeing all the, the advertisements, you're seeing all the Christmas decorations. Um, so w what are the expectations that you have for the holidays. So that's a key thing. If you start off thinking that this is going to be perfect, we're going to have a great time, everybody's, the family's going to come in town, everybody's going to have a wonderful time, all the tensions that we had during the year are going to disappear, everybody's going to get along great, everybody's going to love each other. If that's your expectation and then that doesn't happen, what's the result? I mean, it actually is devastating. I mean, that's where people get so, if you're stressed at the holidays, that just makes it worse, and that makes it carry on past the holidays. So right in the beginning, if you can say, you know what, here's what I want to, to set this up for myself, and we'll, we'll go more specific as we go into this, but I, I want what's, re what's realistic for me right now is this, this, and this. An example might be, instead of going to every party you're invited to or every holiday event you're invited to, you might say, you know what, that's too much for me. I, I need to be able to say, I'm, I'm not going to do that this year. I want to be able just to, to accomplish a couple of things and, and be, be happy with that. So starting off with realistic expectations is very important. This, I, I really like this for a couple reasons. Um, Adopt a child like when I first saw this, I, I wasn't sure what this this meant for for me. A, a, again, it helps to have grandchildren here, but adopt a childlike attitude. So, how do you do that? I mean, if you think about so what what this does make you think about how a child seeing things through a child's eyes. They basically there if you if you take a four year old, a five year old, a six year old, and you don't put any pressure on them and just put them in a room they're going to function in a way that they're going to find some way to play. Agreed? If there's no toys in the room, what will they do? They'll make up something. They'll, they'll create a toy. They'll create a game. They'll create a process somehow or another that's fun. So their, their natural tendency is to play until we beat that out of them. I don't mean physically, but until we, we put so much stress on them and so many expectations on them that they are not doing that quite so naturally anymore. We don't do that quite so naturally anymore. It's, we've got so many things we have to do to kind of lose sight of that. So I'm, I'm saying try to reconnect to how they see things, how they respond to things. It's natural. They're, they don't give it a second thought. They just do it. Uh, it's reflective. I mean, they're, they're reflecting on something they've seen before or something they've heard before or something you've said to them before. It's very cathartic in terms of it kind of frees you up. It frees them up. They don't know the world exists when they're in, the, in that kind of level of play. So, again, it may seem ridiculous to, to put yourself in that place, but it really isn't that hard if you think about where they are. It's projected. They're projecting. Think about when they play 
they're projecting, you know, they're our, they're Batman or they're Spider-Man or they're some a hero, whatever it is. They're, they're um, <coughs> wh whether they're Elsa in Frozen, they're projecting that they're that person. So I, I think if you could adopt the childlike attitudes, that would be very, very helpful in, in the process. So <coughs> here's things that, that we tell, and this is really more for parents or grandparents, but if, if you're, if you can find a way to be around children in a way and, and participate in some of these activities, it's really helpful. So, you know, go do a balloon release, and this, this is, a balloon release is something you can do if there's been a loved one, there's been a loss of someone. You, we, we do, at Tidewell, we do something we call a dove release, and we have every year we have a gift of life celebration. And people come who have had, they've lost a loved one in the past year. And we do it at a church. And at the end of the ceremony, we come out and we, we have them participate in a dove release. And if they want to, they can hold that dove. Uh, it's actually a homing pigeon. Hold that white, white homing pigeon. And they can, I know what they do. They visualize in their mind it's, it's their loved one. And they release that dove. And the dove flies out. And they wait till the other doves are released. And then they all fly back to their home. It's very cathartic for people. Do the same thing with a balloon release. You can, you can write the person's name on it. Uh, you can put the person's name inside the balloon. You can, you can just symbolize the balloon. But that's very helpful uh, for people that have had a loss. Um, go to a children's Christmas play. Go see the Nutcracker. I mean, that's in t I think that's in town now. I'm pretty sure it's still in town now. Something where you're just getting out of your comfort zone, uh, even if you don't know anybody there, just go and, and participate. Uh, fireplace release, kind of similar to balloon release. A lot of people they'll maybe write the person's name on a piece of paper, and put the, the or or write a wish for that person on a piece of paper, put it in the fireplace, let it go to where you feel like it should go. Um, if you've got a family gathering going on. And the, it doesn't feel comfortable, or you can't visualize doing the gift like it's always been. Create some kind of a new fun gift exchange. Do a Scotch Christmas, or a, I don't know what they call it, a Chinese Christmas, where you everybody brings one gift and then you take numbers and trade them. Do something a little bit different than you've done before. Get out of your comfort zone. Uh, Christmas finger painting, uh, roast marshmallows, uh, s'mores contest. Who can make the best s'more? Uh, we have rest. There are variety of s'more recipes, believe it or not. You can do that in a fireplace. You don't have to even do that in an outdoor setting. You can actually do that in, in, inside. So, and, and ghost stories, uh, anything to do with getting out of your comfort zone. So again, more planning, make a vision. Here's your vision. You want to say, this is what it should look like, roughly. I'm not going to be overly disappointed if it doesn't come off just like I want it to, but this is what it should look like. Have a budget for it. This is where people get in trouble at the holidays. It always seems like it costs more, doesn't it? Starting with what? What's, what do you think of as most shocking when you, you're going out and starting a Christmas? You have real trees or you have fake trees? You have trees at all? You bought a, a, a Christmas tree lately? They're like $65 and up for a, a cut tree. Went to, I went to, there's a place called, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, it's, it's on 301. I think it's Lux Art, and they have fake Christmas trees in there. They're, some of them are $3,500 for a fake. They're already decorated. So Christmas, so Christmas is expensive, and here you are starting off. If you have grandchildren, children, family members, and you feel like you, you, if gift exchange is part of that, that can be stressful because you're, you're thinking how much money it costs to have to buy a present. Um, so make a plan, stay flexible. You know, knowing that plan is going to could possibly change, and and you could be doing something totally different than you thought you were going to do. So this is Rudolph's plans were to fly through customs or fly through the security gate, and he had to take his bells off and walk through again. So. Rudolph's already at looking at changes. You can see he's getting stressed. He has a stressed look on his face. So leaving stress, 
what are some ways to reduce your stress this year? Uh, keep calm and carry on is on that ornament. Actually, that'd probably be a good way to do it. Find an ornament with that on there or write it on yourself and, and every day you look at your tree, look at that ornament. So this is, again, really important kind of stuff uh, for relieving stress. We think about it only after it's over, but most people get less Christmas sleep, more in the holidays, uh, either because they're staying up later or because they're, they're worried and they're not sleeping well, not getting enough sleep one way or the other. Uh, they usually don't, and again, if they have a regular exercise schedule around the holiday time, a lot of times people stop doing that. Uh, they, we're just too busy. I would say if you if you have a regular schedule and you do exercise, I would say stick with that during the holidays if you can. Uh, prepare to wait. There's going to be more lines. There's going to be more stuff going on. There's going to be more. How many of you live where you travel on interstate? Anybody travel on interstate? Have you seen what happens at University Boulevard of late? So I I, I drive there every morning on the way to work and every mo coming back every day. I've had to just say. You're going to be stuck. You're going to be waiting and be driving. It's going to be 20 more minutes. And it is going to happen. So there's no point in getting upset about it. For me, it's just you have to just say, I'm going to wait. That's it. Um, plan for bad weather. I don't think you have to worry about that so far. It doesn't look like that's an issue here. I think to, today is supposed to be another record high for Florida. Somebody told me there's a cold front coming in, what, two days, I think. What do you think about that? Is, it, is that good or bad? for the holidays. Good? Yeah. Is it really? Yeah, it's going to warm up again next week. Okay, so, so much for that. Anybody miss snow and ice? No? Somebody does? So yeah, everybody's different. Yeah. It'd be nice to maybe see a little bit of it. Um, these are ones I'm going to go back to, reward yourself. Uh, you really have to be conscious of taking care of yourself. And so back to that plan, that plan that you come up with that's new for you, like I don't think I want to, I'm not sure I can go to that family gathering. It's just too uncomfortable. I'm not ready to do it. Uh, that's going to require you disappointing somebody or you think it might disappoint somebody. So you're going to have to be able to be strong about this is what you need. It's important I have some time for myself. That's a party I don't want to go to, or that's an, a function I don't want to go to. You're going to have to figure out how to ask yourself to do that. So be able to take time to relax, and you need to be able to say, if you reach out, that's how you, you, you probably have to do it. You may have, do you have, does everybody have a family member that is sort of the spokesperson or the, per, the go to person? Um, don't have that. You're the go to person. A lot of times, if you have a family member that you know that you can go to and say, "Look, I'm having a hard time functioning this year. I think I'd like to sit out, but I don't want to have to tell everybody. Can you do the, do the process for me? Can you go talk to the family and say, I'm fine, but I'd really like to do, do this or not do this. A lot of times it helps to have somebody else do it for you. Again, we get caught up in not disappointing somebody else, which is important. So being able to relax, being able to reach out and ask for what you need is, is highly important in this time of year. So this is for parents. I think it's also for you guys. Uh, if you, again, if you have grandchildren, children need exercise. They're going to be eating more sugar. They're going to be getting less sleep. They're going to be more excited, more hyper. So it's kind of important that, that they, they have some normalcy if you can. So give them some exercise. Parents or, or grandparents take turns taking care of them if somebody stays home. Don't leave them unsupervised, obviously. Uh, <coughs> this is something I don't do. Any of you, have, have any of you tried volunteer activities? That's really important, I think. Yeah, we have, at Tidewell, we have, I think we have 600 employees. We have 1,200 volunteers. There are people who, a lot of them who, again, going back to the loss, a lot of them are people who have had a loss themselves and felt like because of the support they got at, at hospice, they wanted to give that back. So they come to Tidewell and they volunteer, and they're, they're, one, they're awesome. We could not do what we do without the volunteers. 
and it means a lot to them too. Uh, I know because when we all when you thank them, they'll say, oh, "I'm getting thanked just by doing it." But and and there's a, lo- a huge amount of things they do. It's not just working with patients. They they bake cookies, they they help us organize events, they sit with patients, they. A lot of times they have a dog that's a trained dog. They'll bring their dog. We have volunteers. I think they're volunteers. I think these are, are the clowns volunteers. Yes, we have a whole group of clowns who come and they dress up and, and they're, they're wonderful for our patients. All volunteers. And I think it means as much to them as it does to the patients, but they never admit that. Or they don't, I think they're just so giving they don't know that's the case. So that's really important. Um, avoid too much sugar. That probably applies to all of us, uh, but particularly with children. This is a biggie. I, uh, it tends to, I don't know if that's the case with anybody. That's why I said this is generic and specific. Uh, there's a lot more eating at, at Christmas. I don't know where you are, but where I am at work, there's a platter of cookies in, almost on every office, on every countertop, or cakes or something, more so than any other time of year. Very hard to not walk by and grab a cookie and, and eat it. So if you're trying to gather, you know, momentum for a diet, this is a, a bad time to have it. People also overdrink during the holidays. Is that something you've seen? I know you don't do it, but is that something you've seen? That that makes people more stressed, more irritable, more volatile, more in need of you know rest. I mean, it makes if you're not eating. Or if you're eating not the same way or you're drinking more, it's going to affect your sleeping also. So that's important. And then spending. There's a tendency to spend more during the holidays and and be stressed about it, particularly if you're on a tighter budget. So those are all things that that kind of enter into why it's stressful. So here's what back to what I was saying in the beginning. After the holidays are over, there's a natural tendency to, to let down. Or to, you know, for whatever reason. It could be because you love the holidays and you're excited about it and it didn't meet your expectations. It could be because there's something that happened during the holidays that remind you of. It could be that it's just that chronic stress and it just makes it, it's just still there. So after the holiday letdown, that's the reason why we have our referrals bump up after the holidays. Not a bad thing. What I would say is if you really need to go see somebody, whether it be a counselor or a grief counselor or somebody just to talk to, that's a really important thing to do. Um, again, the holidays remind you of loved ones that you may, that may not be here anymore. Um, one thing that really interesting when we, when we do grief and loss kind of studies and we, what we do at, at where I am, my team is entirely grief count. They're, they're all grief counselors. They work with families and individuals after they've had a loss. And the one thing that they, they'll tell you, if they can do one thing, get the person to do one thing, is to talk about the loss. That that's, sounds strange. You think that they would do that, but for various reasons, people don't talk about the loss afterwards. Why do you think? What? Reenacting it. Yeah, it depends on the time frame. I mean, if it's been like two or three years, and you know, then then it's maybe more normal not to bring it back up. But if it's been two or three months, uh, people stop talking about it too. You hear what you said? Sometimes pe- it feels like people don't want to listen. That's I always like to bring this up when I'm doing a presentation that we forget about. It, even if it, it's not your loss, if you have a friend or a family member that's had a loss, um, our society is, is kind of geared toward let's move on, let's get this done, let's, let's finish this. So almost 100% of the people we work with who come into our group or come into our individual sessions have had somebody in their life, whether it be a family member, a good friend, multiple family members, have kind of given the impression that they should be over this by now. They should not still be grieving. Does that sound strange? Makes it worse. Right, exactly. It, it, yeah, when you lose somebody, you expect it to get better. 
and it doesn't get better very fast. And, and it, sometimes it doesn't get better uh, over, a, it takes a long, long time to, to rule a loss, and it really does. And people, I think, the general public who have not experienced it or people who have had you know, just a superficial connection to it, they have this idea that it should be a month to three months. I'm just ballparking here. A month to three months, and they think it should be over. And the other piece of it is they don't know how to deal with it themselves. That's the key part. It's not that they're being cruel or unreasonable. They don't know how to deal with it or how to help you with it. So honestly, it's, <coughs> it's, it's not their fault in a way. But what happens is the person who's, who's feeling the loss is they're already feeling vulnerable. They're already feeling, you know, really depressed, let down, uh, some real emotional pain. So when they get the message back that you shouldn't still be grieving, why are you still upset? They think there's something wrong with them on top of their vulnerability for everything else. The reality is there's nothing wrong with them. They're reacting completely normally to their loss. Does that make sense? But uh, go ahead. I'd love to see that. I would love to see that. I'd love to have it. What she's saying is that she had a poem that was in German, right, that was translated. You were able to get it translated, and it talks about it, it encourages people to talk. And that that's the thing. If, if we could do, if you say most of our grief counselors, if they had one tool in their toolbox that they could get people to understand, is it's the only thing that they can say that, that is universally helpful over a period of time is to get them to talk about it. And they, and they do. People feel people who've had a loss feel like they're being avoided, and they are. They are actually being avoided because we don't know what to say or how to help. You can't fix it. So what I tell people is, you don't have to fix it. You're not required to fix it. In fact, you can't fix it. So what you need to do is just be present. Allow them to talk. Just say, you know, just say, hey, do you want? To? And give them permission to talk. But uh, if, if listen, you don't, you don't have to fix it. You can't. You, you got a question? You're happy where you are. You're you're comfortable. Well, I think I, I, what she's saying, I don't know if you can hear it, just uh, uh, people are saying to her, they're they're making a decision for you for how they see it, not not how maybe they would do it, and they're not taking into consideration how you feel or or what you think. Well, one of the, again, you're, you're right on target. Well, you're not probably, you're probably not going to get an understanding of it. It's just they don't know. They don't understand, and they haven't asked you. Tell me what you're thinking or tell me what your, what your thought process is. I mean, just to be able to talk about it, you could say, look, this is, for me, a lot of people, 
want to keep things the same after the loss. They, that's their comfort zone. They want to keep the same things in the house. They want to keep the same decorations up. They want to keep the same family photos. Other people have a really hard time, and, it, and it's, it is, there's nothing wrong with either reaction. A lot of people have a hard time going back and seeing all those things. Whatever is your reaction is, is okay react. That's the other thing we know. Whatever your reaction is normal. There, and, and people just don't allow you to kind of explain. You don't have to, shouldn't even have to explain. They don't allow, they don't gather understanding of why you react the way you react. But everybody's different. One of the things we tell people, again, another toolbox is we tell people, after the loss, right away, don't make any major decisions like a move. You know, do not move, don't, don't sell your house. Sometimes people, like a, a family member well-meaning in Ohio, well, they know you live in Florida, they'll call and say, you need to move in, you need to come up here and move in with me. And they're adamant about it, and they bug you, or they badger you about moving. Well, that's not what you want to do. That's the last thing you may want to do. So it's, it's important that you, you know, make your own decisions and don't make any rash decisions. So you want to have some time. Remember, after the loss, here's what, here's what happens, and if people don't think about this. You're in shock. When the loss occurs, there, there's, there's a shock reaction that can last for several weeks. Um, to give you an example, we have grief counseling. We tell people as soon as the death occurs, we give them letters, we call them, we tell them we have this grief counseling that's available, we have groups, we have individual, it's free. You don't, we're not charging anything. And they literally don't remember that right when it happens. So that's why we have to call them two months later or three months later and remind them because they're they're in shock. Yeah. I think, you know, again, what you're we're saying is people say things to other people that, that from a lack of understanding or lack of, you know, really getting in and, and knowing what that person is dealing with. Yeah, I, I agree. I, interesting. I, you said that when you said that. You said you never say anything. You you put the, you heard that. You, you never say anything to them. Uh, we have. I have. I don't know if I brought them with me. I'll see if if I didn't. If you want to leave your name and wait, I'll contact you. A handout. When I usually do these presentations, I have a handout on what to say and what not to say to a grieving person. And you think that wouldn't be necessary? But it's amazing what people, you, you said, I have a list of about 20 things that every person who's had a loss has had say to them. It's mind-boggling. And the more mind-boggling part of it is I ask them, I always say, what did you say when they, like, for example, let me give you one ballpark example, a mother who's lost a four-year-old child. Somebody will say to them, you have two other children. You have two other children. 
totally demeaning or diminishing the life of that child. Or they'll say, you know, you're young, you're 25 years old, you're 30 years old, you can have other children. That's every single parent who's lost a child has some type of person say something like that. So my first question to them is, what did you say when they said that? What do you think the answer is most of the time? <laughs> what they thought. But it's not what they said. It's usually not what they say. They usually don't respond at all. They usually do what? They go into hurt, shock, pain. I can't believe you said that in their mind. They're thinking that, but they, they don't respond to it like they should. So, so I used to work here, so people keep coming by and waving. So. That's a new, I, can I add that one to my list? That's, that's one I haven't heard. But that's, again, that's what happens. People say things that are very hurtful. They really don't mean it to be hurtful. So I, I, I like what your point is. I always try to encourage them. I, the mother who's heard that comment about you can have other children, they remember that comment for forever, just like you remember that comment forever. And they think about it. They remember what the person was wearing when they said it. They remember how they felt about it. And a lot of times the relationship ends right there. That's the last time they were close when that happened. So what I, I, I agree with you, if you can, it's better to, to say to them, I don't know if you know how that hurt when you said that. I don't know if you realize how important it was. That, that, I don't think you meant it, but that was really hurtful. It's better to be able to get it out there. If you can't with that person, Come talk to one of the grief counselors. Come talk to one of the folks that we have there. Because, I mean, it is, it is a, again, the person that hears it is, is vulnerable. They're in shock. They're not, the last thing they need is to be able to have a confrontation about what something said to them. So the, the more normal thing for them is just to bury it. Just let it, let it go. Oops, sorry. Let it go. And, and that's, that's a normal reaction, again. So, again, this is all part of that formula. It's better that they get to talk about it. It, whether it be, again, with a good friend, with a grief counselor, with a family member, it's better to get it out there. They're going to have a much better chance of reducing their stress if they can get it out there. And so we, we do a lot of that kind of conversation. I, I'll give you some other examples of things people say. You said one. Uh, he's in a better place. That's not your decision. You know, for me, the better place is here in my life. Uh, caregivers especially get that kind of stuff. Somebody's been a caregiver for a for person for a very long time who's ill. People will say things like, "Well, you must be relieved now. Now you can you can get married. Now you can have another life." That's not how they see it. They would go back tomorrow to be in the caregiver with a, in a heartbeat. They wouldn't even hesitate. So that's hurtful. That's demeaning that person's you know existence. So again, those things we hear them all the time. You know, nothing helps. <clears throat> what I tell people to do the most is just be present. Um, be, be there with them. Be, you don't have to talk. You can say, do you want to talk about, I mean, you can say things like, I miss Bob too, you know. And if you want to talk about it, I'm, I'm open to that. Or I can just, we can just be together. You know, that's okay too. I always tell the story, when I first came to hospice, the thing that I did, that I really, later I thought, oh man, I wish I had, wish I could go back. If I had somebody that had had a loss, I would say something like, if you need anything, give me a call. I, you know, what, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? They don't. They never call. They're not going to call. Why not? There's multi. Well, <coughs> yep. 
Well, and another, here's another really important part of that is what is what am I saying? What are they thinking about me if I want to call? Do, I, do they think I want to call them, them to call me? It's a way to say don't call me. I mean, I can't. Ha I don't know what to do. So. Uh, You get that, and we just get in the store. What you want from people is to hold your hand and keep their mouth shut. It kind of covers it. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. And so, but another important part of that is you've expressed what you need. You know, I don't know that a lot of people do. They don't, they don't necessarily, they may not even know what they need, but it's important to be able to express it and be heard. That Because that, that means a lot. Um, we, we hear so many stories about people who, have had the loss, <clears throat> and now they're in that cocoon of being isolated. It's an isolation. Is what happens. They get isolated emotionally and physically. And so for us, what we're always telling people to do, and what I tell people, if you want to do so, instead of saying, if you need anything, call me, instead of doing that, maybe wait a month and call them up and say, you know, I'm in the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, I'm going to Starbucks. Do you want to you want me to go with me and get a cup of coffee? Or you want me to bring you a cup? Give them some options. They can say, no, I don't want you anywhere near me. Yeah, bring me a cup of coffee. Or no, I'd love to go with you. Or go to their house and say, I haven't seen you in a while. I just want to check in on you. Is there anything I can maybe help you fold clothes or put the groceries away? Or I'm going this. Anything where you're just present. You know, that's what they need. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Did you hear everybody hear that? Grandkids came to the house without being asked, brought their own stuff and just cleaned the house, which is that that's that's perfect. Now that's yep. That's perfect. Yep. And and again, that goes into that definition of you can't you really can't fix this. You can't make this person whole again, but you can be present for them when they're when they're going through the process. And that's what they need. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can establish a connection again. Yeah, and feel connection. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 you don't feel she said you need love from from a person and you also don't feel strong enough to ask for that. That's the key part. That's why you have to have somebody else around to be No, it's okay. No, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm happy you're talking. One thing, another thing we do a lot of times is we'll tell people at the anniversary of the death, pick up the phone or go over there and say, I know this, uh, this is the anniversary of Bob's death. I just want to see how you're doing and maybe share some positive memories or share a laugh about some of the stuff that Bob used to do. Um, and people don't do that because they're afraid they'll bring up a bad memory again or they think they're not you, the person remembers. They know the date of the anniversary. They're con highly conscious of it. So you're not going to do any harm to bring up something already bring. If you've given them the choice, if they don't want to talk about it, that you can say, you know, I, I appreciate the thought. I'd really rather not talk about it right now, but I really, it means a lot that you remembered. It means a lot that you asked. That's all. That's the connection. And that's what people don't do because they kind of think, well, we don't want to open up a, a sore. Uh, it's better to open up the store, give the person the option to, to have the connection. So you, everybody's really, you're really on, on target here. You've, 
people have lost that connection. So again, that's why our support groups work so well. It's really interesting. We have, I don't know if you know, we have 22 support groups that we do over the four county area at Tidewell. There are 22 a month that we do, and they're <coughs> very well attended. Some people have been coming for years to these groups. What do you think the reason why they come to these groups so regularly? What, what are we, what's the reason? They can relate. That isolation we've been talking about doesn't occur in that group. The people in the group have, they know the feeling. It's, it may not be exactly the same. The loss is a little bit different, but they know that feeling of isolation. So they know they can come to that group and be accepted, and they know they can talk about it. Nobody's going to say, why are you still grieving? Why aren't you doing this? Nobody there thinks they can fix it. So that's why the groups are so important and why they work so well. Because it's, it's reconnecting or keeping a connection going. Interestingly enough, we have s several of the groups that, that we do like first and third Wednesday. So we have some groups, like there's one in Ellington that comes to mind. They did this on their own. The first Wednesday they meet, after that meeting on Wednesday, they get together and figure out where they're going the off week, which is the second Wednesday, there's no group. And they plan, they go to Popo's, Popo, not Popo's, they go to Poppy's cafeteria on State Road 70. And they go like clockwork. And they're family. They're a family. It's as simple as that. They, and some of the other ones, they do happy hour together, do lunch together. So it really has become a connection Probably because the family or their friends, they've kind of lost that ability to do that, so, or they don't, they don't still do it. it it's just it's fascinating, people, and, and we don't know about it because you're, you're most of us trying to avoid this. Um, again, it's more than just the blues. That would be time to call a grief counselor or call Tidewell. Again, we don't charge for it. Uh, I think in your packet, the, the ladies have been kind enough to put everything, everything you ever need is in there. So our phone number if you need it. Um, and if it's something that's not grief related, uh, I encourage you to talk to a mental health counselor or somebody else that can help you deal with the kind of, or separate it. Well, this is lost, this is maybe going further than it should go, let's get some help. So here's a holiday action plan for you. Three things I wanna keep the same. And you can sit down and do a list of this. And, and it makes you look at what you're already having. So what, are, what you wanna keep. Three things that are new that I'll do this year that might be kind of fun for me or might be helpful for me and do write them down. I think those are really helpful kind of things to do. I think that's all the slide per parts I have. I don't remember what, did, did we already pass out the handouts? Um, there's a couple of them in there I really like to zero in on. Uh, one's a poem, it wasn't the same, I don't think it's the same poem that you had, but. Oh, thank you. Can I share that? Um, it's uh, I will light the candles this Christmas. It's kind of just a visual thing. Oh, good. Thank you. Five years back. So one's the light the candles for Christmas. Uh, it's a simple little poem. Um, there's a lot of books out there you can kind of get. You can actually, if you're interested in that, we have a bibliography at Tidewell. You can go on to tidewell.org and look up bereavement services. And they ha we have our reading list for people. Sometimes they have a saying each day. You can find that. Um, ideas for holidays and special days. Specific to grieving people. Um, that's good to have. Self-care for holidays, special days. More specific things that you can look at. It might work for you. Um, tips for handling the holidays. Again, more, more ideas. Uh, that are specific. I didn't want to get too specific when I was doing this, but I think it'd be something to be helpful. Uh, one thing that I that I people that are grieving commonly say is the holidays make me feel like I've gone backwards. I'm going right through the grief process. I'm going through it all over again, and they think there's something wrong with them. That's normal. That's not doesn't mean there's a, that they've gone backwards. It means that it's a natural process to having a loss. So we always like to encourage people to know that's not a sign that you're, you're getting worse or you're not functioning. It's just a, a normal reaction to the holidays because it, it, it just makes everything broader and bigger. Then the other one is, uh, I like this one especially, holidays and grief 
incorporating those we lost into our traditions. So it has some specific ways, and a lot of people do this on their own, but they might set a table, set a place at the table for that person and put their picture there. They might put an ornament on the tree that that's something that the person likes to do, or might put a person's name on the tree. Um, so they might plant a tree in some some place like a boy club or a girl club, something they like to do. They might plant a tree in their honor, uh, and then they can go visit that tree. So there's a bunch of little things that people do, whatever your comfort level is, that works better for you. So I like that one in particular. All right, I think that's the, the primary stuff. Any, anybody have anything they'd like to share or, or specific things that, how about that you do that make it easier or, or make it or a comfort, put you in a comfort zone? Anybody have anything that works? I like your poems. Get me that, right? Get through McKinsey, okay. Anybody else have anything that they do? I hope you have a great holiday, and, and then if you need anything, again, grief-wise, please call us. We've got great team. I've got 10 grief counselors who are really love doing this, and they're really good at it, so give us a call. Uh, I don't know if it is. Is my name in there? Probably. <laughs> I have cards. I, I have a business card. I'll, I'll find it for you. Yeah, the book is the book is saying goodbye. So there, yeah, and that, and that's what I find people find. A lot of people have one simple thing they zero in on. It helps, and that that's a, a great one. So it don't it don't have to make it too complicated. You know, find something that sort of is a reminder. You know. And emotions with that are okay. You know, it's interesting in this, real quick, in, in this field, when I was in the counseling field, it was kind of important you didn't get too emotional with a client. That was a boundary you didn't cross. In the hospice arena, it's okay to cross that boundary. It's okay to share that, that loss and share that emotion. And we see that happen all the time. And, and that makes the connection there. So that I'd say the same thing for families or friends. If you've got somebody who's had a loss, not going to make them worse for you to be emotional as well or you to shed a tear for that person that they lost. That doesn't make it worse for them. That actually is a, a healing thing for them. Uh, so important stuff. The general public doesn't know this. I didn't know this before I started hospice and I was a counselor. I should have known it. So. had a great connection there's no reason why you can't have a good continue a connection in some way and I, and I I tell you what in in the world is saying again everybody grieves differently I think people who are able to express it sooner the better are generally able to they do better in the long run than people who can't express it so and, and sometimes they just can't they're not ready so you can't push that but generally I, I encourage people to express it w w own pace. So. Thanks so much for coming this morning. I really appreciate you taking time out. Have a great holiday season, and if you need it, again, give us a call. I'll find some cards if you need it. Thanks.